Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Montblanc with the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange in Reno, Nevada, and I'm subbing as moderator for Josh McDaniel with the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center. Welcome to this webinar titled Crown Fire Behavior in Conifer Forests, presented by Marty Alexander with the University of Alberta, Canada, and Miguel Cruz with Ciro Land and Water Australia. This webinar is part of the Extreme Fire Behavior webinar series based on the synthesis funded by the Joint Fire Science Program. The final webinar in the series, if I can move my slide here, there we go. Um, the final webinar in this series that was supposed to take place on April 30th, titled Vortices and Wildland Fire, has been rescheduled for Wednesday, May 20th at 2 p.m. Mountain Time. To sign up for this last webinar or to view video recordings of past webinars, visit the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center website up here in the corner, click on the Advances in Fire Practice icon, and then you can view upcoming webinars and webinar archives. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to let you know that you may ask questions of the speakers or me at any time during the webinar by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel located at the top right of your screen. I will keep questions for the presenters in the queue and field them after the presentation. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio panel and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenters. Actually, before I introduce the presenters, I'm going to, um, Marty, make you the presenter so we can see your your beautiful slide while I am introducing you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Marty Alexander retired in November 2010 as a senior fire behavior research officer after nearly 35 years of service with the Canadian Forest Service in Edmonton, Alberta. He is presently an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta and Utah State University and is an honorary research associate at the University of New Brunswick. His research and technology transfer efforts have focused on the empirical investigation of wildland fire behavior and on the practical applications of such knowledge. The study of crown fires has been a focus of Marty's for many years now. Miguel, Cr Miguel Cruz is a principal research scientist with the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, or CIRO, Bushfire Dynamics and Applications Group. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Forest Operations from the Coimbra Polytechnic Institute in Portugal and a Master's and PhD in Forest Science from the University of Montana. His main research interests are in fire behavior modeling, namely the onset and propagation of crown fires and conifer forests and shrublands. Welcome Marty and Miguel and thank you for being here today. Thank you Jeannie. Uh, how's the sound? Sounds great. Okay, very good. Well, Miguel and I are very pleased to be able to present this uh, webinar today, and um, I, uh, I hope um, I hope it, it meets or exceeds your your expectations. So, um, if you uh, if you haven't uh, met us or, or seen us, here's a couple of mug shots, uh, kind of reflecting our current uh, status. So I'm uh, I guess semi-retired on my acreage uh, south of Edmonton and. Miguel is uh, still going going strong in in uh, Australia lighting fires. I guess um, maybe it goes without saying that uh, when it comes to crown fires, uh, there's any number of implications. Um, we'd like to think that uh, these are the primary ones: this firefighter safety, community uh, protection, uh, but. There's also other considerations in terms of uh, fire suppression, uh, the role and use of, of crown fires, and, uh, and of course, resource damages and, and impacts. In this uh, flow diagram, we're we try to illustrate the, uh, the importance of the various fire environment factors that influence surface fire behavior and correspondingly the link to uh, to uh, judging the onset of crowning and then 
the crown fire behavior characteristics that follow. So there's lots of interacting parts, but uh, the one point we'd like to make is that um, uh, crown fires are supported by surface fires, and uh, it's not to make um, we shouldn't think that crown fires are more important than surface fires. Um, I, uh, Miguel and I like to think that uh, in a lot of ways, once uh, a fire is crowning or that we've achieved the onset of crowning, it's it's really kind of um, a much simpler situation. Given the infinite variety of um, fuel types, surface fuel characteristics, uh, predicting surface fire behavior is is really uh, probably the most um, important factor in being able to predict a crown fire. The uh, outline of our presentation today, um, we've got some introductory remarks to make on crown fires to set the stage. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll touch on uh, the types of crown fires that uh, have been reported in the literature. Uh, we'll explore um, the empirical observations and measurements of crown fires uh, from an experimental and a wildfire standpoint. We'll discuss um, some but not all of the crown fire initiation models that are available. And um, similarly, we'll, we'll talk about uh, crown fire propagation and the rate of spread models that, that exist. Um, and we'll also uh, talk about um, flame heights and, and spotting distances. And wrap up with, um, I guess, some uh, sage or salient points regarding crown fires. So that's, that's our program for today. Introduction to crown fires. Um, some basic concepts or definitions. Um, so that we're all clear on what we mean by a crown fire. Um, crown fire uh, is a fire that advances through the crown fuel layer, usually in conjunction with a surface fire. Crowning can be classified according to the degree of dependence on the surface fire phase. And so um, when we talk about crowning, uh, we're talking about the fire ascending into the crowns of uh, conifer trees and spreading from crown to crown. So our focus today is on conifer forests, and we, we want to acknowledge that crown fires exist in other forest or vegetation types, such as eucalypt forests or in, in shrublands. But today our focus is on conifer forests. The, uh, the type of conifer forest um, that we're visualizing is one where there's uh, more or less a distinct gap between the surface fuels and the lower canopy base of uh, this, the forest stand. A um, couple of things of note, um, canopy bulk density is represented by the, the fuel load in the overstory layer divided by the depth of that layer. And uh, is uh, ex usually expressed, at least in um, metric units, in terms of kilograms per cubic meter. Um, generally, there's some form of ladder or bridge fuels exist. And uh, the canopy base height um, is judged to be uh, where there's a continuous point in, uh, in live foliage uh, from the lower base to the tops of the trees. A um, couple of other points. Um, the available crown fuel load um, typically consists of needle foliage, lichens, um, small dead end live twigs. And uh, as noted here at the bottom, uh, ladder or bridge fuels um, uh, can exist in the form of bark flakes, uh, lichens, uh, some needle drape. Um, understory conifers and, and tall shrubs. Um, 
anytime we refer to fire intensity or fire line intensity um, in this presentation, uh, it's in terms of Byram's fire line intensity uh, as a function of heat of combustion, the amount of fuel consumed, and uh, the fire's rate of spread. So uh, that's our introductory uh, remarks. Now we'll go on to the type of crown fires. And uh, it's worth noting that even when we classify wildfires uh, as crown fires or crowning fires, um, any such fire is going to contain areas where there was ground or subsurface fire activity as well as low to high intensity surface fires. Uh, so the fires depicted here might be overall described as a crown fire. Um, there's obviously lots of patches of forest that didn't experience crowning activity. A couple of historical notes. Um, the term crown fire has appeared in um, forestry and ecological literature since at least the 1880s um, and uh, for the longest time uh, there were two forms of crown fire um, imagined. Um, the earliest date that I've um, been able to determine that uh, the term dependent crown fire and running crown fire were used was in the late 1930s um, and that's continued um, Oh, even up into the early 70s and beyond, uh, if you've got a copy of Brown and Davis from uh, 1973 from the McGraw-Hill McGraw Forestry uh, book series, you'll notice that uh, that terminology, dependent crown fire and running crown fire, are used. However, the literature is, um, is, uh, includes many other um, crown fire terms, fully developed crown fire, wind driven, plume dominated, intermittent crown fire, and continuous crown fire. So these, these terms you'll find in the literature in addition to um, what's come to be uh, the more or less uh, accepted um, classification by Van Wagner. So Van Wagner's um, classification scheme for crown fires um, involves three types, uh, passive, active, and uh, independent. And so we'll look at each one of these um, accordingly. Passive crown fires um, can occur under two broad situations. Um, in cases where you have an optimum or low canopy base height and a optimum canopy bulk density. Um, if fuels aren't quite dry enough and it's the wind strength is not quite severe enough, um, it falls below the, the threshold and so we've got uh, uh, some partial uh, canopy fuel involvement but not a full-fledged crown fire. The other case is where um, uh, a more open forest type and uh, uh, the um, canopy base height may be um, uh, ab above the threshold, um, canopy bulk density is below the crowning threshold and so again we get some canopy fuel involvement but not uh, necessarily uh, full-fledged crowning. This is not to suggest that in either situation uh, we can't have high intensity uh, fire behavior. A point of note here is that um, and something that uh, we found quite often in the literature is uh, during our preparation of our synthesis is uh, the notion that um, some people feel that, that torching constitutes passive crowning. Um, thing is, uh, generally torching doesn't generate any kind of forward uh, fire spread, so we don't view torching as um, individual tree torching as, as passive crowning. Active crown fires, um, 
that term um, coined by Van Wagner, active crown fires, is is really what we uh, when we think of crown fires or crowning forest fires. That's uh, generally uh, the most common type, um, and it's uh, associated with uh, ground and surface fuels that um, readily permit uh, the development of a substantial surface fire. Um, a, uh, also, uh, a moderate, moderately high canopy or crown base height is, is required, and uh, a fairly continuous layer of moderate to high bulk density and low to normal foliar moisture content is generally associated with, with active crown fires. And it, um, at this point, I'm going to uh, turn it over to my good friend and colleague, um, Miguel Cruz. Thanks, Marty. Um, good, mo good afternoon, everyone. Um, all right, uh, picking up from where Marty leave, left, uh, so these concepts of uh, passive and active crown fire propagation really uh, considered as fire propagation at a, a pseudo steady state and it's uh, somehow how you make uh, fire uh, behavior simulations, you assume a constant wind, our best guess of wind, speed, some fuel conditions and you make our simulations. Now we know from uh, wildfire activity that uh, given the variation in wind speed and other, other fire env environmental factors, um, really uh, crown fires don't spread only as passive or active, is more really a combination. Uh, and Van Wagner termed this as the intermittent active crowning, which kind of brings together all that, um, those aspects. In these photos, you, you see some of those um, patterns of uh, fuel consumption, where uh, you have uh, areas fully defoliated, so uh, high intensity, uh, fire propagation, crown fire, then you have bands of unburned uh, canopy fuels, that's when a lull comes to the, uh, affects the, the leading edge of the fire, the fire is going to drop to the surface <clears throat> for some time and then picks up again within the, the next gas cycle. And so the fire is going to propagate in, in the surges uh, manner. Uh, and that's important to consider also how you we, we look at, at um, crown fire propagation, namely some of the, the concepts uh, that exist for crown fires, namely, Marty, could you? Yeah, like, like fully, do, yep, okay. And uh, this also brings to this aspect of, of the, the conditional crown fire. Uh, again, this is a concept um, that rests on, on, on the idea of a steady state propagation. And the idea here is that uh, uh, some stands, uh, for instance, might uh, support uh, active crown fire propagation, but they are really difficult to initiate crowning. Um, this also comes from the, the crowning and the torching index that Scott and Reinhardt put together. And the idea is that uh, you might have a stand that has been treated, uh, that crown fire is very, is very difficult to initiate, but if a crown fire comes from elsewhere, from a, a neighboring stand, uh, uh, you might get to this stand and continue to propagate as a crown fire, as it does need the conditions to initiate the crown fire. But when you look at the aspect of the transient nature of fire propagation with the gusts and lulls in wind speed, you realize that this concept uh, might not be valid given that if a fire comes as an active crown fire from a neighboring stand, in the next lull, it will drop to the surface and then will not crown again. So ruling out a bit the, the conditional crown fire concept. Also, as we, we note in this slide, uh, in the last about uh, 15 years, this idea has been put forward there's no empirical proof that such a, a concept I exists. Um, so
So I wonder if in the in discussion, if some of the attendees have been observed this kind of uh, fire behavior will be interesting also to discuss. Uh, Marty, can you pass the next slide? Now the other, also, uh, the other type of ground fire that Van Wagner uh, considered is this um, independent ground fire. And again, we, we, we put a bit of the question, is a fact or a myth? The idea here is that uh, the crown fire does need uh, the surface phase to support its, its propagation and the heat transfer is really dictated by the crown, crown fuel combustion. Uh, this image here is also a good depiction of how we idealize this, um, this phenomena where fire is going to propagate right just in the canopy with almost horizontal uh, flames. Again, uh, there's very little uh, evidence of this uh, phenomenon to occur. And this will be envisaged as the worst kind of crown fires, because if you have such a horizontal flame in the canopy, these will be really fast uh, spreading fires. Uh, next slide. Now, Van Wagner, um, in 93 kind of reviewed also this uh, concept of independent crown fire and noted that it's, it's dubious um, that it exists, although we still see a lot of uh, publications discussing this aspect, but not really based on, on physical evidence, but more as um, speculation about the effect of fuel structure on fire propagation. Um, but so what uh, Van Wagner considers that um, this will be very unlikely to occur and for this to occur, given some simplified heat transfer calculations, the flame in the canopy need to be almost horizontal. Uh, if you think about that, uh, if the idea also is that if the, the flames were kind of horizontally, uh, any fire brands that would be generated with, within the canopy, uh, burning would be transported horizontally and initiated mass fire, mass fire ignition ahead of the fire. That's a very common process in eucalypt forests. Uh, but so if this happens, we we'll immediately rule out the idea that the fire will be spreading independently in the canopy because the spot fires will be igniting surface fires ahead of the fire. In any event, um, being conservative, uh, there's, cons there's still the idea that this can occur in some extreme conditions, namely in very steep terrain and just as a short-term fluctuation uh, in fire propagation, but not really as a steady state phenomena. Next slide, Marit, please. All right, uh, the next section is really about uh, what or how we know what we know about um, ground fire behavior, right? And uh, next slide, Marty, thanks. Um, so this, um, as, as a lot of fire uh, phenomena, you know, occurs in difficult places, remote places, very, very difficult to measure, uh, even to observe in detail. This also leads to a lot of speculation, uh, things like what we talked about the independent crown fires. Uh, and uh, the way we have been doing in the past to better understand um, the processes that drive this kind of fire propagation is through observations in mostly in experimental ground fires, small scale uh, ground fires and some also wildfire observations. These are really key to understand and, and, and all, all we understand about ground fires come from these kind of observations. They're also key to develop uh, empirical based models as we will talk a bit ahead and evaluate how good they are but also to 
provide benchmark data that can be used to check simulation studies. It's very easy when you do simulation studies, if you don't have a good grasp of what uh, what's the, happens in the real world to get into, to produce pr uh, simulations that are not realistic at all. And more so when, with fire, which that it's a, a pre-data poor science, let's say. Next slide, Marty. So throughout the years, um, there's been a, a, a lot of work, uh, mostly in Canada, um, some also uh, in Australia. But in terms of um, crown fire and surface fire behavior in, uh, in conifer forests, uh, three main places we got data from. And um, well, when, I, when, when we started uh, working together, Mario and I, um, Mario offered to allow me to reanalyze some of the Canadian uh, fire behavior data sets and that's how this work really started and with that Canadian data and some of uh, Australian data and Portuguese data from Paulo Fernandes, uh, we assembled a database of about 80 fires. Um, well documented experimental fires and that's just this this all in chart here just depicts the distribution in rates of spread fuel consumption and intensity for uh, the surface fires passive crown fires and active crown fires in this database so really covering a, a quite a wide range in um, fire behavior in the rates of spread intensity flame heights uh, and also in fuel structures, and we'll just go ahead and um, show some in the, the next slides. Uh, but this is really uh, the basis of a lot of our of our work in terms of empirical modeling and, and, and model validation. Uh, when you talk about experimental um, studies, uh, really or crown fire studies, really into to mention uh, Charlie Van Wagner's work, he, he was a pioneer in terms of this kind of work. Um, so what he did in the Petawawa uh, for experimental station, he started to burn some uh, stands of, of red pine. In terms of um, fuel complex, this really you can consider a, a optimum outdoor fuel complex because it's quite homogeneous, so allow you to get out of the lab and go into the field and have the most homogeneous fuel. And as you start lighting different fires, start to look at the eff effect of specific fuel aspects and then also wind speed in the fire processes. So this fire starts in the early 60s. And another thing that is allowed, as you see in this top uh, right image is because uh, allows the close observation of fire um, propagation allows to to understand in detail how the transition from a surface to a crown fire is occurring and all these aspects of active and passive crown fire it was from these fires that he derived this classification of um, crown fire propagation that Marty just mentioned. Uh, next slide, Marty. So the, the, the Canadian Forest Service went through um, several programs in different fuel types through the 70s and 80s. Um, and again, quite a broad range of fuel structures of canopy bulk densities, of canopy base heights, and canopy fuels. Uh, you know, from the mature jack pine, a more, a more uh, established uh, forest to the immature jack pine, um, which is really dense, overstock stand, very high fuel, canopy fuel load, and, and pretty much a continuous um, fuel layer with ladder fuels from the ground to the canopy to the more open 
uh, stands that are in the bottom here, the black spruce, as you can see, quite clumpy uh, nature of the forest, we have iso isolated trees and quite wide gaps between clumps of trees. Um, next slide. Marty, um, so this really gave uh, most of the focus in these in these previous studies was really on um, measuring rate of spread, fuel consumption, and fire intensity, and how they related to the Canadian fire behavior or fire weather index system, and to develop practical models for predicting um, ground fire propagation. The last uh, project uh, from the Canadian Forest Service was this um, ICFMI, the International Crown Fire Modeling Experiment, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, this is quite an interesting uh, a pro project. Um, for us, it was a, a collaborative effort with a lot of organizations, uh, Canadian Forest Service and U.S. Day for a service. The, the impetus for this project was to um, measure some fundamental um, fire behavior data uh, in this crown fire that would be used to validate or, or close uh, Frank Salbini crown fire uh, propagation model. A uh, model we'll talk a bit ahead. Uh, so we had uh, people, uh, people, researchers like Brett Butler looking at uh, radiation from the flames, Terry Clark looking at the flow velocities in, in the flames as well. So really the focus was a, a fundamental description of the, um, the fire. And, and this data is still used right now uh, to validate or evaluate the, the the predictive capacity of uh, physical physics-based models. So this data set is out there. Uh, now, one, one, um, as you look at this, these images, these plots were also much larger than previous ground fire experiments, about uh, 150 by 150 meters. Um, and if you are a skeptical person, you'll always wonder, well, how will a fire in a block like a forest like this, 150 by 150, be able to represent a, a large wildfire? Are there scale issues here? Are, 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 are the data from these fires limited to this kind of situation and not be representative uh, from uh, large wildfires? That's a fair question. Um, Marty, next slide, please. And um, there's some evidence that uh, no, the data from these fires really uh, capture well what's happening in the flame front and can be used to calculate large fire development. This is a particular example um, of a escape fire in a, in a 1980s project, um, the Porter Lake project in, in northern Canada. And what happened in, in this uh, case is one of uh, the plots, this plot L5, uh, escaped the control line and caused a wildfire. In this table in the lower side of the, gra of the slide, you have the wind speed for this uh, experiment, experiment and the associated rate of spread for, so for a wind speed of about 30, with a rate of spread of about 33 meters per minute. Uh, this L5A was a section of the fire just after the escape. Uh, so there was a bit of a gust in wind, increase in wind, average wind, and the fire really picked up and took off. In this case, it, fire propagates about 80% more than the, in the plot. But as the fire developed, this CR6 is for the main run uh, with the dotted um, pattern. Within that main rand of uh, maybe uh, three, two, three kilometers, with an average wind speed of uh, 26 k an hour, the rate of spread was still very similar to the small plot. So just saying that the, the, the plot sizes used in these experiments were representative of a broad scale fire propagation. So given confidence of the validity of these 
experimental fires in capturing some of these data. Now, of course, it's not to say that we don't need wildfire data, and that's really a, um, an, also an important data uh, that we need to use in, in, fire, in, in fire behavior modeling. And Marty, could you jump to sli another slide again? Um, and um, so, we need, this, we need this work we have been carried out, uh, Marty and I, also in Mari, uh, Mari has been collating a lot of wildfire case studies uh, and pushing for this uh, case study analysis of wildfires as a, a source of data that can be later used for modeling, uh, modeling validation. Right now, from the US in, in conifer forest, uh, there's about a data set of about um, 60, so US and Canada, North America, about 60 wildfires, uh, and these a bit of distribution of rates of spread for these wildfires. So, um, this in, in metric units, uh, but about an, as an average uh, rate of spread uh, is about 1.5 miles per hour, can be almost used as, as a rule of thumb if there's no capacity to conduct simulations as an average rate of spread for a crown fire. Although, of course, there are situations, more severe situations, that we can get much faster rates of spread. Uh, and a good case in point is the um, Mount Muirhead fire in South Australia. This is uh, up to now uh, documented as the fastest rate of spread observed in a, in a rel relatively large run in a crown fire. Uh, in this map, we have isochrones of this fire, and this is mostly grass. The white is grass, and the green areas are radiata um, plantation forests. Um, so for this, this is a fire in Wesh Wednesday in, in southern Australia in 1983, and their winds up to 80 k's an hour, uh, that's gusts but the fire spreading at about uh, 12 k's an hour, which would be about seven miles an hour. So that's the, the fastest observation we, we could find in the literature of rate of spread. Martin mentioned to me a few days ago, also in Canada, very similar rates of spread. And really useful information that you can use when you develop models, some of the models Mario will talk about, uh, want to know how these models behave in these extreme uh, fire weather events. Are they uh, producing sensible results or not? That's where you kind of use some of this data. Marty, before we pass to the next section, would you like to mention anything else? Yeah, I, I guess uh, one point is um this Mount Muirhead uh, observation is for about an hour. Um, the, uh, but there have been documented runs in conifer forests of uh, uh, six and a half kilometers uh, sustained for uh, you know up, upwards to 10 hours. So that kind of gives a bit of a an, uh, an idea of, you know, the upper end and crown fire rate of spread. I'll move on. <clears throat> Miguel? All right, yeah, yeah, I, I, I had it muted. Um, so moving on into the crown fire initiation, and um, what you'll do here, is describe a, a couple of the models that exist, and use that as uh, the, so use the models as analogs of reality as the models try to capture the variables that affect uh, the onset of crowning. Uh, next slide, please, Marty. Thanks. Uh, so. Um, Van Wagner, uh, some people call it the theory of for, for the initiation of crownings. Some people might call them a model. 
Um, that's just a, a, an equation that describes very well the main, uh, some of the main uh, um, variables determining the uh, set of crowning. So what Van Wagner did, um, he combined some theory, some physical theory on, on the on changing temperature with height above a fire and uh, the ignition needs, the energy needed to ignite fuels with different moisture contents and he put up this equation, he essentially tells us that uh, an intensity that's necessary to ignite a canopy uh, that's situated a certain height above the ground, this canopy base height, with a certain moisture content. Uh, foliar moisture content, so the, the content, the moisture of live fuels in the canopy. Uh, so these were the two variables that uh, Van Wagner came up with as, as the, the most important variables uh, affecting the onset of crowning from um, a canopy uh, standpoint. And then, he, he, so what he did is that uh, consider that for certain forest structure, there will be for with a given canopy base height and fully moisture content, there will be an intensity, a surface intensity that's required to ignite these fuels. So we had this equation and then we have this parameter here, the 0 0.01. He didn't have this parameter, so this is a, is a proportionality constant and what he did from one of his experimental fires that was really on the cusp of transition from a surface to a crown fire, as you observe that and you knew the canopy base height of the stand, the, the moisture content, and he could calculate the intensity of the surface fire, he rearranged things and derived this constant that comes this value 0 0.01. So this closed his model that's pretty much uh, used for all fire predictions of the onset of crowning in North America. So how this used, uh, Marty, can you move to the next slide? Is that, so for each stand with a given structure, you'll have a critical intensity for initiation. And um, if you have a, a certain fire, you calculate the fire intensity. If the fire intensity of the surface fire is lower than this critical, intensity, you have a surface fire, if it's higher than the critical intensity of a crown fire, and if it's within the, um, the range very close, uh, those two values are very close, they'll be uh, uh, within the transition area, let's say. Uh, although normally we, we tend to use this as a trigger, if it's above is crown fire, if is below is surface fire, right? Um, Marty, next slide. Now the this of you as any any model that, that we'll talk here as uh, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the real the strengths of this model is its simplicity, as um, you only need two crown fire properties and an estimate of surface fire to use the model. Uh, also another of the strength is that semi, uh, the physical base, let's say, of the, of the model that um, the equations that were underpinning what's in the model also gives some validity uh, even outside just one fire. And so. Uh, Remember that this model was just derived from one fire, but it's quite used, and that's why it's that physical base that's behind it that provides uh, applicability to other situations. Um, nonetheless, this simplicity also causes some limitations in the model. Uh, further research in uh, in the 90s uh, showed that uh, you know this zero points. 1, 0 0.01 constant, it really integrates everything else that's in the fuel complex, that's in the burning environment, that you're not quantifying. So when sometimes we depart very much from those idealized conditions, 
uh, this value is not valid. And one of the, the points making here is that if you have a, a quite different um, residence times, uh, these uh, residence times would, would, would also define, sorry, sorry, five different residence times will, will result in different const, in different uh, constants. So whatever we use this model with this constant, we need to be bearing in mind that also as things vary, as the fuel complex vary, uh, if you have higher fuel loads with higher residence time, might be the case where the constant is not so much valid and the results will not be similar to what you could expect. Same way, um, this model does not consider the effect of other variables like temperature, RH, and within stand wind speed in changing the plume angle in cooling the air within the plume. So again, some factors that are not in, in the model, um, but again, the um, um, by its simplicity and easy to use, this overcomes some of those limitations. Uh, next slide, um, Marty. Uh, another another uh, that we can see, uh, not just, uh, this is not a limitation of the model, this has nothing to do with the model, but it has to do how we use the model. Uh, and also it's true for other models we present here, is that any time you have a model system where the outputs of other models are used to run one particular model, there's error in the system that's going to propagate, that's going to impact the end result. So in this case, if you want to use the Rotomel, the sorry, the, um, the Van Wegener crown fire initiation model, uh, you'll need an estimate of the rate of spread, then from that you calculate intensity of the surface fire and then you apply the relationship to see if you have a surface of a crown fire. And errors that are in the system can propagate and give erroneous results. Another aspect, that's what this graph wants to show here, is that in North America um, or in, in, in the US right now, fire intensity is not calculated on the same way as Van Wegener calculated. Van Wegener, uh, when derived his model, used fire intensity from Byron's equation. Whereas in the US fire modeling systems, fire intensity is calculated from reaction intensity, different metric, and the results can be quite different. Now the issue here is that when Van Wegener model is parameterized based on Byron's intensity, but is run later in, in, in the modeling systems right now, with an input with intensity that's from uh, reaction intensity, that diff gives a, a different fire line intensity, that's going to create uh, errors in the system. And this graph here just show that uh, how much that error can be. So for a certain critical fire intensity, it's about 3,000 kilowatts, kilowatts per meter, this dashed line, uh, the intensity to reach this, uh, or the wind speed to reach this intensity is quite different if you used Byron's intensity or if you used intensity calculated by system like Nexus or BA plus. So that's just uh, an error that's introduced by the system is not a limitation of the model itself, is uh, the system that doesn't integrate the doesn't use the, the right model for predicting the onset of, of crowning. It's, it has to do with model linkages that are not consistent with the original formulation. Uh, next slide, Marty. So um, when we, we start uh, doing this uh, work together, Marty, uh, Ron Wakimoto from University of Montana uh, and myself, we, we start thinking, well, um, can we do, can we model this uh, onset of crowning process from a, a, a different way and look into some of these issues, namely fire, uh, namely error propagation when you put too many models together. Um, and so based on that data set uh, I mentioned earlier about 
80 something fires, we come up with this uh, more statistical approach to model the onset of crowning. Uh, what we did, we used some uh, uh, logistic uh, regression analysis to develop a model. We put all the data in the, in the statistical package and start looking what would be the variables that uh, statistical states says that are the most significant given this data set. And you come up with a model for the crown fire occurrence that show that the most effective, uh, most determined variables were wind speed, um, the estimated fine fuel moisture content, so the, the, the moisture content from the dead fuels in the litter layer, this is calculated from uh, Rotomel 83 uh, fuel moisture tables, uh, the canopy base height, um, or also we, we, we came up with a different term because of some issues with canopy base height, uh, it calls this fuel straight to gap, I'll, I'll just uh, clarify that uh, in the next slide, and also surface fuel consumption. So essentially when you look at these variables, uh, surface fuel consumption and estimated fine fuel moisture and wind speed are really related to rate of spread of the surface fire and intensity, so that's like the critical fire intensity, and then canopy base height is similar to Van Wagner uh, variable, right? So what you'll notice, notice here is that there's no foliar moisture content, and that was an interesting result from the, this analysis that the statistical analysis didn't show a significant effect of foliar moisture content on the ignition of the canopy fuels. Uh, next slide, uh, Marty, please. Uh, now, why do you call, we use this fuel strata gap and why this distance from canopy base height? That's because Canopy base height is, is a, a specific cultural term that has to do with the live canopy, with live fuels. Uh, in, a, in a lot of our data, we have a lot of later, later fuels. And um, so to not make canopy base height uh, having two definitions, one would be related to just live fuels, another one related with life and later fuels, we come up with this fuel strata gap that's really tells us the distance between the bottom of the, the crown fuel stratum, both live and dead, that will allow the vertical fire propagation and the top of the surface fuel layer. In a lot of cases, uh, they will be, this value will be equivalent to canopy base height if there's no ladder fuels, but if there are ladder fuels, there'll be a, uh, some adjustment, let's say. Marty, next slide, please. And um, so what, what this model gives us um, is a probability of crown fire occurrence. In this graph uh, is wind speed uh, in x-axis with some curves for uh, different fuel strata gaps and the, tr the threshold uh, for crowning 0.5 or 50 percent, that's what we assume. Although this, this uh, approach, because we get a probabilistic um, output, also allows to put some more uh, personal decision making in, in, into, uh, into the analysis. Uh, it doesn't, whereas if a model like um, Van Wagner tells you, if you are above the threshold, you have, you have crowning, if you are below, you have surface, in here, you can play with the numbers and say, well, if it's between 40 and 60 percent, I might think that is within the transition zone, but I'm, I might have a, a combination of surface and crown fire. If I have uh, more than 90 percent uh, probability, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a crown fire, and uh, if I'm less than 10 percent, is really a, a surface fire, no doubts about that. So it allows us the probability output allow us to have a, a bit more of a, um, a personal uh, reading of the conditions. Um, although we don't use much probability analysis in 5 
behavior modeling uh, tend to go more for deterministic. Uh, in terms of evaluation of this, this model, we, we did some, uh, some work with some available data. Uh, Marty, next slide, please. And uh, this table really just shows um, the evaluation statistics for this model. So the top data there is for statistics with the, the data used in model development. About 80% uh, of the data was, per, was correctly predicted. That's a pretty common number. Uh, for this kind of logistic regression and analysis. Uh, then we also try to evaluate the model against some other uh, data sets that we have, uh, namely these Porter Lake experimental fires, uh, very low canopy base heights, and the ICFMI experimental fires. And with these, you can see all the all crown fires and all correctly predicted by the model, although uh, we should note that we did these fires, they were really ignited under conditions that uh, the researchers knew that we were going to have crown fire propagation. So uh, it's really um, only if the model really wrong would predict wrong outputs because the burning conditions were uh, high to very high. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have much data in the low hand in the lower hand or even transition area to evaluate this model. So um, again, this this evaluation can be a bit biased. It looks good, but it's because the data was uh, naturally in, in the high hand of the, um, the scale of uh, fire potential. Um, Martin, next slide, please. And I just... Uh, go briefly also here, so a, a different model we developed. So we came from this um, fully statistics uh, models, just don't taking into account the functional forms of, of how the variables affect fire behavior. It just it goes into the software, the software uh, spits a result and that's it. And that has some limitations. And so our next work, and this was in collaboration with uh, Brett Butler from Zool Fire Lab and Jason Fortover, also from the Fire Lab. Um, we look, we try to look into this process of fire uh, transition from a more fundamental point of view. Here is a, a schematic of the a wind-driven surface fire. And so what we want, we know we have a, a fire in the understory and, and what you want to know is what's, how the surface fire is going to ignite the bottom of these canopies. Uh, and Mari, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so in this, in this work, uh, really what you wanted to do is develop the, uh, what we would call a semi-physics-based model uh, that we incorporate the main processes driving the ignition of the canopy. So um, what I'm interested really is the ignition of these green fuels in the middle of the slide, bottom of the canopy, as with the assumption that if these fuels ignite, there will be enough uh, fuel in the, in the canopy that will allow for vertical fire propagation within the canopy. So this little red box on the right really tells us about um, the main process. So. We know, knowing that uh, ignition of these fuels will occur at a certain temperature, the ignition temperature, we want to know uh, how this temperature, as a fire approach, uh, how this temperature of these fuels change with time. And this is wiggly, wiggly capital T, wiggly lower T, a change in temperature with time in, the, in these fuels. And we know those are, a propor are proportional to the heat flux that's received. Uh, and heat flux being the radiative and the convective heat flux. So what we need to do is describe this fire, this surface fire below, from its most, most fundamental um, characteristics, how that, how the, 
it's going to uh, drive a plume, a buoyant plume above above its fire uh, with a certain temperature, this TP, and wind uh, and vertical velocity within the plume, and also the plume size, and also this will drive the convective heat transfer to the, the fuel particles, and the other aspect is the radiative, and we train, need to describe how this uh, surface fire, all the radiation released in all directions, the fraction that's going to reach the bottom of the canopy. So we start seeing, when you look at this problem, well, uh, you need to describe a lot of features of the fire. Um, to know the size of this radiating surface, you need to know the flame depth, and the flame depth is going to come from rate of spread and resonance time. At the same time, this flame depth is going to determine the size of this plume and how much, uh, how much time the fuels are inside the plume. So to do this kind of modeling, uh, there's a lot of sub-modeling that's carried out. And Marty, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, and so these are... Uh, a schematic of this um, of this model, um, uh, although a bit complex, but the complexity is, is eaten away from the user, and, and is implemented for some for plantations in 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 radiator plantation in Australia. And so it goes. It goes. Uh, we have weather and a few complex descriptions. Few complex. We use fuel models because for rate of spread we used um, Rotomel fire spread model. Uh, you need to have a canopy fuel layer, canopy base height, um, other variables, bulk density. So from those inputs, we're going to calculate basic surface fire properties, rate of spread, resonance time, flame geometry, height and depth, intensity, and some other flame temperature time profiles. So this really describes the physical uh, environment of the fire and defines the energy source. From that, we partition radiative and convective heat sources. Uh, again, apply that those more heat balance equations to calculate the fuel temperature and uh, with a, a fixed, assume a fixed ignition temperature of uh, 320 C, uh, we determine if crown fire initiation is possible or unlikely. And so we have a, a, a similar process from the Van Wagner, Van Wagner used the intensity, used the fuel temperature as the discriminator if you're going to have um, crown fire ignition or not. Uh, I think I will, st I, I, don't, I don't have any graphs this of, for this model really. Um, it takes a, this model takes a much more inputs than any other model, so it makes it a little bit more difficult to use. Advantage of the model is that allows to uh, predict crown for initiation in conditions, more marginal conditions that are not as common, like uh, very light fuels, um, where maybe the Van Wagner is not as such, as such a good model of very heavy fuels, uh, but in normal burning conditions, like average burning conditions, give results very similar to Van Wagner 77 model, which is really interesting a result because here we have a more physical based model uh, predicting the same as a very simplified model, so it just gives um, credibility to validity of also the Van Wagner model that even in the simplicity produces in average conditions the same as we're getting in this more uh, physical based approach. Uh, Maria, pass to you now. Thank you, Miguel. Um, yeah, very well done. Um, so we move on to um, the, the topic of propagation and, and actual crown fire rate of spread. Um, as part of Van Wagner's uh, uh, theories on the start and spread of crown fires, um, there was the issue of uh, 
we've reached the onset of crowning. Now can it propagate as a, as a fully developed crown fire with a, a wall of flame and, and flames above the canopy? And um, based on uh, some previous work by Phil Thomas in England, um, Van Wagner proposed this rather simple uh, uh, theory or, or model, if you will, that um, a critical minimum spread rate required for continuous flame front development within the canopy uh, was a function of the mass flow rate uh, divided by the canopy bulk density. And uh, the mass flow rate uh, was parameterized on the basis of, uh, of uh, experimental fires in those, in those red pine plantations back in the 60s. Um, that simple formula is plotted out here as a function of rate of spread and canopy bulk density, the, the curve you see. Um, also plotted here are experimental um, passive crown fires uh, shown as open circles and active crown fires shown as solid dots. And um, both Miguel and I have, have always been amazed at how well it uh, separated this, uh, these two types of crown fires, as, as, uh, and there appear to be no exceptions. A um, couple of other points is um, no passive crown fires have been carried out um, when uh, or occurring when the canopy bulk density is um, less than 0 0.5 kilograms per cubic meter. And similarly, um, there have been no active crown fires documented where the uh, canopy bulk density has been less than uh, 0 0.11. So in particular, um, the value of 0 0.11 is um, been speculated by, by others, uh, namely Jim Agee, as, as a critical threshold. And indeed, the empirical or experimental evidence uh, supports that notion. Now, <clears throat> there are um, a number of crown fire rate of spread models that um, exist. Uh, Rothamel, uh, the Canadian Fire Behavior Prediction System, uh, one developed by um, Miguel and Ron Wakamoto and, and myself, which and then one by uh, Chef the, uh, in the fuel um, characteristics classification system. And finally, there are any number of physics-based models uh, available. So we'll touch on each of these. Um, the Rothmel model um, published in 1991 came out of um, on the heels of the 88 Yellowstone fires. And in this particular work, um, Dick Rothamel uh, correlated the uh, observed crown fire rate of spread for eight wildfire observations with um, the predicted rate of spread from the surface model and found that uh, uh, the average adjustment factor was 3.34. So um, a simple model. and. Um, um, has been used for many years in many different applications. The Canadian Fire Behavior Prediction System works on, um, on a very simplistic basis. Um, there are a number of um, uh, adjustments for various things such as um, dryness in the forest floor layer, but basically it comes down to uh, correlating uh, the initial spread index from the uh, Canadian FWI system, which embraces uh, wind speed and uh, uh, an estimate of uh, the moisture content of fine fuels based on temperature and humidity and, and so forth. Uh, so that's correlated against rate of spread either from uh, the experimental fires that uh, we've discussed previously, uh, coupled with um, wildfire observations um, in, uh, in Canadian forests. Uh, so there's um, uh, ten, or, 10 or so uh, fuel types that are prone to crowning. And so this one is just one example for uh, a mature jack or lodgepole pine fuel type. Um, this reanalysis that Miguel mentioned of the existing um, 
data that went into the Canadian forest fire behavior prediction was uh, also reanalyzed uh, not only with respect to uh, crown fire occurrence or initiation, but also rate of spread. So going back and uh, examining uh, the spread rates against uh, uh, more fundamental characteristics um, as shown here in these scattergrams uh, was undertaken. The two equations that um, came out of this reanalysis uh, are, are shown here. And what I want to emphasize is um, the, uh, the simplicity of, of the inputs for active crown fires. Um, so they would have had to met that um, criteria for active crowning uh, with respect to canopy bulk density as discussed earlier. Um, is the function of wind speed, uh, the canopy bulk density, and the uh, fine fuel moisture content estimated from the Roth ML83 uh, fuel moisture tables. Uh, so rather simple models, uh, passive crown fires. Uh, the best result we found was that um, uh, it was a function of uh, this criteria for active crowning is determined by the, uh, the canopy bulk density. So uh, the models uh, discussed in this reanalysis, uh, we began putting those together in a, in a software package back in uh, 2003. Uh, you can download the, the latest version. We are updating uh, the software uh, relatively soon, but you can find um, on the frame site, um, you can download the, uh, the current software package. I think we're at volume uh, 2.1. Um, how well do, uh, do the Rothamel and, and um, Cruz et al. models work? Um, in the upper two graphs, A and B, um, we've got the uh, predicted uh, rate of spread from Rothamel's model compared to uh, the observation of um, some 60 uh, fires, wildfires from Canada and the United States. And uh, you can see, regardless of whether it's um, experimental fires being used at the, in the evaluation or it's uh, that set of wildfires, uh, it's under predicting by r roughly, um, uh, you know, somewhere we, right around 3, uh, 2.6 to 3.8. And there, there doesn't appear to be any sensitivity to the burning conditions, as you kind of note by almost the vertical um, pattern in both cases, and it was a rather interesting result. Um, in plot C, a lower left-hand uh, graph, um, predicted against observed, but the, uh, the fires shown here, experimental fires, were the ones that went into the, uh, to the, the model itself, so you would expect the fit to be uh, uh, rather good. Um, now the the Cruz et al. model was compared against that 60 or so wildfires, as shown in uh, plot D, and you'll see that uh, the model slightly over predicts um, rate of spread. Which um, yeah, there's nothing nothing wrong with over predictions. It's it's the under predictions that uh, that are uh, have serious consequences. Um, the fuel classification, um, uh, the fuel characteristics classification system as a, a crown fire rate of spread model uh, that was uh, presumably based on a reparameterization of the two Rothamel models. Um, and one of the outputs is a, is a straight um, crown fire rate of spread. So um, here's the results of um, of comparing the model against um, 15 observations um, in black spruce uh, from the data set that we compiled on wildfires back in uh, 2006. So as shown here, it's there's an under prediction trend of, um, of roughly, uh, well, on average two. And uh, so it's under predicting by a factor of two the uh, the force or the fuel class fuel characteristics classification uh, system. Um, so, uh, Miguel, I think I'm turning it back to you at this point. 
we'll discuss uh, one of um, Miguel mentioned earlier, uh, Frank Albini's uh, model for uh, crown fire pr propagation developed um, back in, uh, uh, I guess, initially in the mid-80s. Um, yeah, thanks, gonna, thanks sorry, Mike. Um, sorry, sorry, Miguel, I'm going to jump in for a second. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know, I'm, I I think the webinar was scheduled for just an hour, so we're like 15 minutes over time. Um, we won't get kicked off, so you can continue, but I just wanted to let you know because the, um, uh, the, we're losing some of our attendees. Okay, understood. Okay. That's fine. Great. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Marty. Uh, so, um, yeah, so in here, we, well, we will not go through... Uh, all the physical based models, namely the more the more recent uh, numerical simulation models, but use just um, uh, talk a bit about the uh, Frank Albini model. As as um, uh, mentioned, uh, this is uh, so Frank developed a model in the early 80s, and then on the late. Uh, um, Late 80s, he published a paper where he applied the model to crown fire propagation, um, and um, throughout the years, uh, this this model was a, a bit of a, was a, the promise that uh, this model will be would be able to capture well crown fire dynamics, the uh, rate of spread. Um, so uh, initially, there's also uh, was computational uh, requirements kind of limited the you know the testing the models and Stephen Ellis and things like that. But also, what uh, was limiting the model was knowing some of the basic characteristics that were necessary to describe the the radiation from uh, uh, a crown fire flame, and that was the impetus uh, of, uh, again, of the ICFMI experiments was to capture some of that uh, fundamental data. Uh, so we, the model could be closed and, um, and could be used. Uh, Martin, ne next, next slide. Um, thanks. And, uh, and so this, this is a, 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 a table that um, from a paper from Brett Butler in 2004, uh, where it shows some of the modeling results um, and the sensitivity of the model. And what this table shows us here is two fundamental parameters for the model. One is the effective radiometric, radiometric temperature, so the temperature of the flames assuming a black body, um, and also this radiation ratio has to, to do with the radiation above and below the, the canopy layer. And um, so Brett did this analysis and shows that uh, even that uh, these two variables that they, they were measured by Brett uh, in the um, ICFM experiments, uh, so, but, but it's not really, we cannot know them uh, easily in a predictive sense. Uh, the model is quite sensitive to these parameters. So in these three first uh, rows of the table where you have plot A, um, see from uh, assuming a 1200 effective radiometric temperature and a radiation rate ratio of 0 0.3, the model predicts a rate of spread of 34. But if you go to the second row, same temperature, but increase the radiation ratio by about 10%. Uh, Eight percent uh, to 0 0.35. Uh, now, by by about 20 percent, um, a bit less than 20, you almost double the rate of spread, right? So here we have a variable that you cannot know or measure uh, or model, but a small change in the variable are going to is going to uh, almost double the rate of spread. The third situation, you have a small increase. Uh, about 5% increase in radiometric temperature. We have um, a radiation ratio of uh, about 10% more of the initial simulation, and you have uh, a rate of spread that's triple the initial one. And it really the point to make here 
is that um, is of well, for once, is the value of this field data that to show us that. Uh, you need this field data to validate these kind of models, uh, but also, you know, for about 20 years we've been waiting for uh, a physical based model. But when you have the data to really evaluate it, um, it, it a lot of assumptions that we put in the model uh, might not uh, might show that are not valid, right? And uh, I guess we have still the same. Uh, as we go to the numerical models, uh, and we didn't talk here about numerical models and their capacity to predict ground fire rates of spread. They'll be beyond the scope of our presentation. We tend to focus more on the empirical uh, model, empirical analysis. But um, just so the difficulties in some of these models, given the un unknowns, uh, the physical model given the unknowns in the um, the fundamental environment of the fires because really there's not much data besides the data that Brett captured um, in the ICMI there's not much data on the fundamental characteristics of ground fires to base the simulations. Uh, Marty can go into the the next. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll pick up here. Um, yeah, basically flame dimensions and spotting characteristics of ground fires. Uh, there's much we could talk about, but um, um, we'll, we'll focus on a few concepts here. Um, many, uh, many examples of, uh, of flashes of flame exceeding, uh, you know, upwards of 50 or more meters above the tree treetops. Uh, the reality is, you know, what is the average flame height, if, if you will, and. Um, Early in, in Byram's work on, um, on uh, as published in 1959, he, he suggested that perhaps um, uh, you, you just need to, uh, uh, his surface fire or his flame length intensity relationship was not going to be valid for crown fires, but if you added um, one half of the stand height, um, he felt that, uh, that that would be reasonable. Uh, Rothamel uh, in his 91 paper suggested maybe Thomas's relationship was uh, was better able to estimate flame heights. Um, Butler and company uh, suggested another functional form um, back in 2004 and um, it when comparing these various approaches or models against uh, a couple of the uh, red pine plantation fires with nice uniform fuel structure, uh, there doesn't seem to be any consistency uh, uh, with respect to predicting flame height or, or, or flame length of crown fires, uh, at least to date. Um, the, uh, one of the things that's noticeable from the crown fires carried out at the ICMI site in the Northwest Territories was the uh, increasing depth uh, as opposed to an increasing height or length um, to the flame front. So um, my, my simple rule of thumb is uh, if you know it's an active crown fire uh, or spreading at such and such a rate, then uh, to estimate the flame height, just uh, multiply the, uh, the stand height by uh, two to three or simply two and a half. Miguel? You're on, Miguel. Yep. Miguel, did you? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm on. Yep. Um, just going quick note into sporting and uh, Brian Porter uh, present um, the sporting uh, seminar a uh, few weeks back, and um, but he focused on on the results. Uh, on the what is uh, volume one, and since the publish uh, since that volume one was published, there was a a, a paper that came out. Um, these Albini, Alexander, and Cruz. Uh, so essentially, uh, Frank Albini in the 90s developed these uh, or extend his work. His early work was on spotting from uh, surface fires or torching trees. He expanded that work to consider the 
maximum spotting distance from um, crown fires. And uh, so this this graph just to show how uh, for same wind speed and drying conditions how uh, it's max, this maximum spotting distance for a crown fire uh, from Albini's model is different from his earlier models for surface fires. Uh, so it's about a 2 to 2.5 uh, longer maximum spotting distances. And in this paper, and for those that are not aware, so Frank Albini uh, died in 2005. He never published his work, and so that's. Um, uh, but we had a report, and uh, so to not waste his research, Marty uh, pushed forward to, to get this work published in the International Journal of Wild and Fire, and I also help him out. Um, and in this paper, there's also quite um, a synthesis of, of observations uh, of maximum spotting distances in conifer forests in North America and you know most of the very common uh, two kilometer spotting distance uh, in some case up to five k's in some uh, some rare cases uh, so really showing it's very difficult to validate a model like this but showing that you know the results are on the right order of, of magnitude there's also some cases like the sentence fire that spotting distance are more than 10 kilometers, but those are associated with very high wind speeds aloft um, and not what the simulation, this is more of a, a simulation that uh, consider uh, a normal wind profile in the lower atmosphere, let's say, uh, but it might be the case if, if you input this model with a, a more realistic wind profiles with very high wind speeds, you might also get uh, large, quite large spotting distances. Uh, pass to you, Marty. Okay, we're uh, at the wrap-up session here, uh, wrap-up topic. Um, you know, we've uh, certainly uh, believe that you know a lot has been learned over the years compared to the early days with, uh, in say, the U.S. Forest Service when. Uh, uh, this quote from uh, Norman McLean's book um, is, uh, I think, rather apropos. Um, we've uh, come to understand a great deal about uh, crown fires from the uh, observations of experimental fires and uh, correspondingly the monitoring and documentation of, of uh, crowning wildfires. Um, just on the note of sustained fire growth, um, if typically when a fire crowns, it, it generally doubles or triples its spread rate. So the area burn um, becomes four to nine times greater than if uh, with a corresponding surface fire. And uh, assuming unlimited uh, fuel continuity, uh, crown fires um, are capable of burning an area of upwards to uh, 70,000 hectares within a single burning period and a corresponding perimeter length of, uh, of 160 kilometers. So this is a theoretical number, but it's also been um, shown to occur, for instance, um, the 1968 Lesser Slave Lake fire in, in central Alberta. Um, what happens when a fire crowns? Um, well, there's additional fuel uh, that's being consumed compared to a surface fire. Um, and this uh, additional canopy fuel consumption combined with the uh, increase in rate of spread that occurs after crowning um, leads to a quadrupling in fire intensity. And so there's a dramatic increase in flame height and depth and in turn um, heat transfer that takes place within a few seconds. Uh, and the spotting activity can also very quickly increase in both density and distance. So there shouldn't be any wonder um, why crown fires seem to literally blow up. Um, the situation is further exacerbated by um, a fire transitioning from a, a point to a line fire 
uh, encountering a, a major change in slope steepness, uh, entering a, a chimney or chute, or any combination of the, of the above, including all three. Um, what, uh, what can operational fire folks uh, do to help themselves? Well, uh, Miguel and I both believe that uh, increased monitoring and case study documentation is a way to help yourself um, uh, examine the models even after the fact um, can be a, a huge way of, of making adjustments in future predictions. Miguel? Yep. Um, just a, 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 a note in some of these grounds. Uh, ground fire model evaluation. Um, well, as he mentioned here, uh, we, we really focus, we, we focus on, on the more empirical based models, which are like um, not a, a model that predicts everything. Each model predicts a feature of um, fire behavior. And we can say that uh, we do that that way because there's not a, a model that at right now is able to predict the full spectrum of fire behavior um, range and, and characteristics. Um, on the note, in, in terms of uh, the um, evaluation, and this also mentioned a bit before, on those errors uh, in terms of um, model um, error propagation and also use of the, the Rotomel 91 crown fire spread model. Uh, a bit also want to notice here some of the simulation studies. So one thing is getting uh, over or, or under prediction errors within a, a operational fire behavior prediction. Uh, in the next last few years, seen a lot of use of these models for um, in simulation studies to look into the impact of fuel treatments um, into fire potential. In, in a paper we put out a few years ago, what we did is again pick up our wildfire behavior data set and look how that uh, data compared with the simulation studies. And so what you have here in this graph um, on, on the left hand side, we have the, the wildfire data on the top, that kind of cloud, and on the bottom we have the simulation studies. So these simulation studies are all related to peer reviewed journals. Uh, so what we found is that the almost simulation studies are almost uh, a different universe from the wildfire case studies. And again, these wildfire case studies are quite, most, a lot of them quite severe fires. That's where they become a case study. Uh, when you want to learn something or what happened. Um, but what you see for this uh, figure in the left is the wind speed and fine fuel moisture content of the wildfires that led to the, the main runs. And at the same time, the wind speed and fine dead fuel moisture of the crowning index in these studies. So the conditions that would lead to crowning. And what you see because of that under prediction bias in the Rotterdam model, ground fire spread model, uh, users are using quite low um, dead fuel moisture contents that you never observed in a wildfire situation. Some fuel moistures go down to two or even lower than 2%. Whereas from the wildfires, the lowest we, we got documented was a 5%. Similarly, uh, in terms of wind speeds, this simulation required much higher wind speeds to produce what you'd think reasonable um, results in terms of rates of spread. So this is just to highlight some of that um, under prediction bias in the studies and how this is influencing some of uh, the decision making also in terms of fuel treatments that are required to uh, produce, let's say, crown fire proof um, for stands or landscapes. 
pass to the next slide, Marty. So in the end, we also put here a bit of a list that we consider topics considered worthy of investigation. And these topics are from the point of view of applied fire behavior knowledge, not, not from the point of view of fundamental knowledge gaps that we have uh, in terms of understanding uh, fire dynamics, but things that we believe uh, will be quite helpful for the fire practitioner to have knowledge to apply in this decision making. One of them is a, a model for predicting crown fire flame heights. Um, again, we, we, as Marty briefly mentioned some of the approach that existed. Uh, again, there's no studies that looked into crown fire, specifically a crown fire flame heights. Most of the measurements come from some photographs, some video, some really, not really a, a comprehensive description of the flame dynamics within a crown fire. Uh, other aspect is uh, we have models for crown fire initiation. Uh, we have disregarded this aspect of crown fire cessation and uh, how if you have a crown fire that reaches a different stand, what's going to take to bring it to um, a surface fire, right? Or um, uh, so what are the few characteristics that will not just not allow the crown fire to initiate but will bring the crown fire to the surface. Uh, also, and as, as Marty mentioned earlier, uh, we found, although uh, th th there's this common perception that crown fires are unpredictable or very difficult to predict, what we found from the, the uh, statistics of error from surface and crown fires is crown fires really are more more sort of crown fire rate of spread uh, really more easy to predict actually than surface fire and because because surface fire variation uh, is over a higher order of magnitude go from very slow fires very incipient flames to high intensity surface fires whereas the range of crown fire propagation is in a sense, narrow in terms of order of magnitude. Uh, also, surface fires tend to uh, be influenced much more by surface fuel conditions, whereas ground fires tend to be dictated mostly by wind and, and fuel moisture. So again, but if you want to know, well, the onset of crowning, we need to be better at predicted surface fires. So hence the emphasis that still surface fire propagation is a key knowledge if you want to be able to predict the onset of crowning and crown fire propagation. And the last topic is this um, understand uh, how, we can, how we should define the base of the canopy to predict crown fire uh, initiation. Uh, again, there's many different ways to consider what's the canopy, the canopy base height. Uh, some people might consider that's the, the lowest limb, that's more a CV culture approach. Uh, you can have a visual estimate of where f enough fuels are there. Some uh, researchers uh, have looked at to use a critical bulk density uh, to define this lower canopy above which the fire will be able to uh, propagate vertically, but um, there's a lot of values. Uh, for this can critical canopy bulk density, but none are supported by uh, research, really just um, best guesses from different people, and they're quite distinct. So um, again, a, a worthy topic of investigation. Marty, up to you now. Yeah, um, what we've covered today is um, uh, contained within uh, the volume one of the extreme fire behavior synthesis and also a, a special issue of fire management today um, and volume two um, will hopefully be out uh, soon it just goes into greater depth um, on um, on the subject um, if you want more information including uh, all the publications produced during the, uh, the project uh, they're available. Probably just Google the uh, Crown Fire Synthesis and you'll 
come across our website. I would like to acknowledge um, Nicole Valiant and uh, Dave Peterson from the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station that were uh, involved in, in the project. Um, uh, three JFSE projects contributed to uh, what we've covered today and, and more. Um, if you'd like to contact us, uh, here are our email addresses. Um, uh, questions, comments, uh, observations, we're, we'll all, we're uh, all ears. And uh, with that, uh, we end. Um, for those that stayed on, we really appreciate your attention. And uh, I'll turn it over to um, um, Jeannie for uh, questions and comments. Great, thanks. Um, for those of you that are still left, if you have questions, um, please open your questions pane in your control panel and type your questions in and I'll field them to the presenters. Um, the first question is from Mike Morrow. He asks, there was a rumor that a fire in the Northwest Territories last year was documented at 200 meters per minute spread. Have either of you looked into it to validate that it was possible? But before you answer that question, um, would you mind going back and um, keeping your last slide on the video screen, uh, just so that for video purposes, for the questions, people can, can see the last slide. Okay. Um, I don't think people want to stare at the go-to webinar slide. Okay. <laughs> If it's a problem, don't worry. Don't worry about it. I, I thought it, you had it right there. You can go ahead and just. Uh, you can go to launch to go web. No, that might be something different. It's okay. Don't worry about it. So um, yeah. So uh, do you think that it, it's valid that there was a fire documented documented at 200 meters per minute spread? Uh, y yes, I'm I'm well aware of that. Um... That, that observation uh, was actually done by a gentleman named Dennis Contilio, who's a retired CFS, uh, retired Alberta Forest Service employee. Uh, he was in the territories. Uh, I've discussed it with him, and uh, uh, indeed, um, uh, yeah, he, he's pretty confident of the 200 meters a minute, which um, would match the Australian observation. Uh, the question is, um, uh, you know how long the run, uh, how long did the run take place? Uh, you know what was the corresponding weather conditions? So I think the rate of spread observation is valid. The question is, uh, you know, do we have a good enough detection network with respect to weather monitoring to uh, uh, get an associated wind speed? Okay, great, thanks. The next question is from Don Klingler. He asks, would you agree that live fuel moisture has a major effect on the continuous crown versus single tree or clump torching? In Michigan, we know that when the live fuel moisture was 110, we can expect continuous crown um, or crowning in jack pine. I hope I got that right. Miguel, I'll let you handle that one. All right, uh, yeah. Um... Uh, foliar moisture content is quite a, a, an issue in, in the late stage plantations. Um, the, the, the analysis, again, the, the statistical analysis uh, didn't show uh, an effect of uh, foliar moisture content on the rates of spread of crown fires. Um, that could be uh, because that could be because two reasons. One is that the data set is not uh, broad enough to um, have a good description of that variable. And so um, that's why maybe we don't see it. Uh, the other aspect, and also we did some analysis um, uh, on the topic, but the difference so, uh, on crown fires in, in conifer and also in shrublands. Uh, and you collect data from uh, seven or ten different studies, uh, people looking at shrub and fire. So not conifer crown fires, but still a, a fuel complex with a lot of green material. And um, what uh, the analysis show in all these studies, and these studies from Australia, Europe, uh, South Africa, in you know, shrublands up to two, two meters or so, 
none of these studies show also a significant effect of foliar moisture content on fire uh, spread rate. Uh, one one, re one reason could be that um, for these fuel types, there's a lot of dead material. So uh, again, uh, the light fuel moisture only is affects the combustion of light fuels. If you have enough dead fuel in the canopy, as you have in some shrublands, that might overcome that uh, damping effect of light fuel moisture. Another aspect is also that um, the heat fluxes that come from these high intensity fires are, are quite extreme uh, from these very tall flames and deep flames and that might be the reason why that so that, that those heat fluxes are going to overcome the effect of uh, let's say go from 110 to 130 percent fuel moisture um, so that might explain why you're not observing that effect in other places but um, we, yeah, we are well aware that uh, there's quite good evidence, empirical evidence, that in the lake state uh, forest, uh, life fuel moisture is quite a, an important variable. But again, I think it seems to be a, um, quite a, yeah, still a, a, again, a, a knowledge gap, something we don't really understand well, particularly for those forests. Great, thank you so much. The next question is from Cordy Timstra, um, or Dave, Sh oh, that's just the, that's the name that shows up. Dave Schroeder from Alberta ESRD asks, what tree parameters to use for calculating CBD? Needles, needles plus twigs, does it differ by model? Yeah, can you repeat that one, uh, Jeannie? Yeah, what tree parameters should we use for calculating CBD? Is it needles, oh. needles plus twigs, or and does it differ by model? Well, yeah, good good question, Dave, um, or Cordy, or both. Um, <laughs> the only uh, uh, post crown weight sampling uh, is not a popular uh, activity in undertaking these experimental crown fires, but. Uh, the only uh, rigorous work on canopy fuel consumption was was done at uh, the ECMI site in the territories. So, um, yeah, I, you know, it, it, like most things, there's a bit of art in deciding, um, you know, what proportion. But I, I think you can feel confident, obviously, that uh, any fine, really fine fuels, thermally thin fuels, uh, such as needles and lichens, um, the, the most flaky part of the bark within the tree bowl. I mean, those those are definitely counted. Uh, I think you can any dead twigs um, below one centimeter in diameter. I think you can toss that in. And from the ICME sites, um, we found that uh, at least half of the live material under um, a centimeter in diameter could also be thrown in. Um, but the only way to truly know is, to, you know, is to do more post-burn crown weight sampling, which uh, I would have liked to have thrown a few slides in showing what the crew looks like at the at the end of the day, uh, cutting off uh, black uh, branches and twigs. But uh, <laughs> anyway, good question, Dave. Uh, it's this is discussed in uh, in volume one, and. Um, uh, but I direct you to the ICME, the main ICME paper by Stocks et al. 2004. Great, thank you so much. Um, and the last question is from Clara Casada from Andalusia, Spain. She says, thank you, Marty and Miguel, for your excellent presentation. I just would add that there is running a uh, running research project in Spain called Infocopus, um, researching crown fires involving some research study centers um, C4 Enia, Lorizon, University of Cordoba, uh, Junta de Andalusia um, in Crown Fire Management and Prevention Studies. One of the project working groups has collected accurate field data about the different forest situations present in Spain and the wide range of fuels present in our conifer forests, as well as uh, the importance of knowing, oh wait, as well as other species. One of the points that this group highlights is the importance of knowing um, 
the reality in terms of fuels and fuel models in order to know or evaluate the type of fire threshold levels, initiation, propagation, crown fire, occurrence probability that we could have. In my opinion, the present and future implications on prevention and firefighting operations are evident. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Miguel? <clears throat> no, no, uh, no, no comment. Thanks, thanks for the note, and uh, yeah, we'll be um, good to look into what um, you guys are doing in Spain. Uh, but yeah, no, no, no specific comment on that. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. That was the last question. I would like to let everyone know that a link to the recording of this webinar on the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center Advances in Fire Practice webpage will be sent to you automatically through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. Um, thank you all for your participation today, and thank you so much, Marty and Miguel, for your presentation. You're welcome. Thanks very much, Jeannie, for organizing, everybody for attending, mm -hmm. and Marty, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. All right. Have a great day, everyone.